Hi all, I have a new openings course you might want to check out. It's called A Fun Lover's Guide to the Major Chess Openings. It's on a special discount code for the next four days, super low. If you choose the link, if you type in the link below, Kings Crusher TV slash chess openings dash special. And if you miss that in the next four days, uh, if you're looking at this later, check out Kings Crusher TV slash chess openings. But I will try and renew uh, these links at the start of each month. So the special ones, dash special, they should be renewed for most of the courses at the start of each month. Uh, so look out for that. So yeah, on a special discount. So what do you get in this course? How is it structured? Well, my structure, I've basically uh, introduced some basic concepts and philosophies that I really like generally in chess and other subjects and how they relate to openings. So alignment, trade-off theory. And I've explained why I've, I've eventually took a fun lover's perspective. I think uh, it's uh, there, are, there are thousands and thousands of openings and, and even, you know, gambits and, and even, you know, variations within openings. You can spend a whole lifetime on one particular sub-variation probably of a variation of an opening. Chess is so absolutely vast you know you could spend your whole lifetime just just studying Sicilian Sveshnikov for example so this course is more broad it's looking at openings and I thought an architecture for it which I am you know personally fond of and I, I settled on was to categorize openings as systems for the lazy like me that don't want to spend all this time learning opening theory because maybe you want to spend time uh, you know, training your tactics or, or looking at end games. You know, there's all these other weak links in the chain of chess understanding. It might, might be psychology you need. You, know, you you might have have this problem that if you lose, you get this heart and then you play terribly after. So that's that's another weak link in the chain. Let alone opening middle game, end game. There's all these other you know links like past pawn management, uh, handling the bishop pair, handling particular pawn structures. You know, there's that. 30 major you know pawn structures so all of these are like massive skill sets so my point is with systems is that it's not the system itself giving you a great understanding of chess it's the time it affords to actually study other aspects of chess that's my key point that's why i've underlined uh systems so i've mentioned for example, my, my knight c3, the Dunstall reverse tango as, as a system, the English opening, uh, the wet lettuce I've mentioned, the London system, you know, that's the classic system which has risen hugely in popularity. And I think even some, you know, very strong players, I think they're not really understanding the benefits of it for the, for the new pe people in chess because they've forgotten what it was like to be new. If you haven't got all of those hundreds of different skill sets, then you, sometimes you just want to get a decent position for the middle game and, and test your your other skills, like your tactical skills. So having a, a, a fairly solid position without any bad piece is, is like the London system. And if we look back in time, you know, Bobby Fischer in his early part of the career was playing, uh, you know, the King's Engine attack, you know, E4, E6, D3, you know, with the idea of, you know, Knight D2, Knight G F3, G G3, Bishop G2, you know, King's engine attack. You, you play the King's engine defense with, with Blank and he fought, you, you play it with White against the French defense, for example. So, you know, even the very strongest players in chess history have used systems. Bent Larson had his B3, which got, I don't know, it got damaged in popularity when, when Spassky thrashed him. But even so, B3 is a very, very dangerous weapon of choice, especially for online blitz chess. Nakamura won the ICC opened not that long ago, a few years back, with B3 and B6 in most of the games. So if it's good enough for Nakamura to win like these blitz tournaments against other GMs, what is the problem with these systems? I, I just think they're a great way of getting time to invest in maybe other aspects of chess, or just time to go and watch Netflix after, but having a decent game of chess beforehand without being completely smashed. And what's worse, you know, people could be disheartened that they go into someone's, say, Grunfeld, which I really detest, because it represents the, the other spe other end of the spectrum to systems. You know, you play one move wrong in the Grunfeld, and you're dead, and they've, they've booked up on the Grunfeld. They haven't watched any Netflix. You know, they've been spending all their weekends at this Grunfeld book. What was the point in going into their Grunfeld? There was no point. You just, you just basically lost the game of chess, and it could be an entire one-day game of chess, out of the opening so if you stick with your systems at least you're guaranteed a good game Cole's system you know uh, Adam Roof I saw Adam Roof a great tournament organizer playing a uh, 
the coal system. Benko's opening, that's not entirely bad. You know, Benko used G3 to beat Fisher and Tao. Uh, you know, the Hodgson system, this is not entirely bad. You know, Julian Hodgson won several British championships with the Trompowski. Did he follow the theoretical crowd? Uh, so, you know, Torrey attack, you know, did, did Torrey, you, you know, these people, they often won with their names openings. The systems have a place that your time investment to, you know, you don't have to treat chess as some memorization game of huge amounts of technical opening theory. That's my major point with the systems. And they represent part of the architecture of this particular course. And another part of the architecture is, is the standard openings and variations. So I've tiered all of these three uh, parts of the architecture. Tier one, you know, the most recommendable from my point of view, my bias, my personal bias coming into it. Tier two middle and tier three, you know, mostly, you know, you should avoid. <laughs> like Bong Cloud, you know, Bong Cloud, you know, E4 and King E2. But even so, you know, I take a kind of liberal approach here in this fun-loving course that the agenda, the context for for what the opening is used in, you know, it could be just for, for your fun and amusement. You you could be a budding st streamer and you want to have outrageous titles like, you know, crushing someone with a bomb cloud. You just want to like, like play these for fun, for stunts if you're streaming or maybe, you know, you want to be an entertainer or you just you just find enjoyment um, out of playing some of, some of the more uh, dodgy stuff. So you'll find that in the tier three of, of, of these things. Uh, so we've got, you know, the important openings and variations uh, that I thought, you know, and, and uh, I've gone into specific variations, especially the Sicilian. I've given a lot of more example games because I really respect the Sicilian as a really exciting, you know, fun loving <clears throat> opening. So I've actually kind of dynamically allocated examples and that's how the course will evolve. The, the, if I find something new and fun, you know, a lot of fun, I'll give more examples for it than something more boring generally. So the actual evolution path, it's this is only the start, and it's a big start. It's more than 30 hours of content. But the evolution path, I want more examples where I, I think it's more fun. So the number of examples is aligned to how fun I think something is. So Sicilian Defense as an example has got a lot of examples. So that's that's the kind of philosophy of me using the example games uh, to highlight ideas and particular variations. So you've got tier two for openings, uh, tier three. And then the the third kind of major section is the gambits, which, as many of you know, I, you know, I love playing the smith Morrow gambit against the Sicilian. So that's in like tier one, Albin counter gambit. So all these gambits, I think, you know, openings have a place, you know, you're using them in the context, not everyone wants to be a professional player playing one day games and super solid openings. A lot of people, they want to often avoid the opponents like tons of theoretical knowledge and just get, you know, an exciting game. But I've made the argument that the special argument for gambits, from my point of view, is that they, they maximize your peace activity. Uh, quite early on so they give you that field of extra development uh, you know you're giving up material that trade-off theory you're giving up material for you know better development than your opponent and sometimes better king safety and some some of the gambits contribute to your central control they have other strategic imperatives the benko gambit which is a tier one you know long-term queenside pressure so it's not always about king safety but it does quite often the gambits to me one of the core things i think underestimated is the power of semi-open files on faster time limits. A semi-open file is like, imagine the motorway, which is just one way. It's one-way traffic. So a lot of the gamuts, they give you these semi-open files, and that's what makes them, you know, really dangerous. From one semi-open file, you can get, like, x-ray tactics uh, quite often. So, you know, the power of semi-open files, the faster the time limits, it's like a recipe for disaster. It's like if the opponent makes mistakes and you've got a lot of peace pressure and activity... That's why the gambits are often super effective the faster the time limits. is the amount of peace pressure, which makes weaknesses more exploitable sometimes. That lead in development, that extra peace pressure, a weakness is only a weakness if it's really exploitable. So the gambits, for me, have been a great source of joy. And hence, uh, you know, that is one section likely to evolve more rapidly on, on further iterations of this course in the future, further installments. And if there's any, you know, exciting, you know, fun-loving openings systems or gambits that you think i've i've missed out please you know do message me on youtube or or, or anywhere you know message me and uh i'll try and you know add those in future editions this is a, a very much um 
an evolving course more than any of the other courses I've created because there are literally thousands of openings it really scratches the surface but I wanted you know I, I, I think there was a gap in the market just not having this context driven perspective on openings that it's it's particular context like it, you know most players are playing now online you know blitz so why isn't that addressed you know you look at batsford chess openings modern chess openings it's all just from a, some sort of theoretical perspective as if you're, you're a grandmaster you know if they're written by grandmasters they're, they're only talking about their openings you know the grandmasters are often just in, involved in these closed events nowadays the super gms and they don't want to like lose with black they they play super solid stuff should the average cut club player play like that not necessarily so that's kind of you know part of the core philosophy of the course that it's horses for courses you know openings for, for your particular game context so i have emphasized uh gambits and I, I will, if I've been too critical of certain gamuts, I will even replace entire videos. I, I did replace, uh, for example, the Jerome gambit. I did discover, you know, even though I've analysed it before, you know, it's good to revisit analysis. And there are possibilities of actually, you know, winning with the Jerome gamut. I, I know it's shocking, but there are actually ways if Black, you know, did make mistakes. And that's got to be factored in in an analysis of these openings you see the problem is if you analyze this stuff with computers you just won't see all the blunders that are waiting to be made as Tarsico has said all the blunders are waiting to be made but the engines won't suggest any of those blunders so you think they're totally ineffective but that's not the case the extreme case say the Jerome Gambit you know there are ways for black to be just two pawns down if they lose two pieces in succession which is possible if they, if they if they blunder terribly so anyway so you know sometimes you can give these unsound openings the benefit of the doubt but usually the professional players who who give you opening courses they won't take that into account so they won't even mention you know this this stuff it just will never be mentioned so i try and you know give things a chance basically but the tier tier system you know for me is like the most respectable gambits first you know gambit like benko gambit marshall gambit you know which michael adams has, has used you know, as a great tool you know these these are like tier one uh gambits so in a nutshell yeah there's this architecture in this course which which i've uh and it sort of ends with conclusions and philosophical points points so the basic architecture i i do an introduction I talk about the philosophies of you know, general rules for recommendable openings. So the do's and don'ts. I've broken up the do's and don'ts. And then I basically put three tiers around systems, openings, gambits. Systems, openings, gambits. And so, yeah, I think they have a place. Gambits also are, are great trainers for your tactical you know, players. You get stronger tactically. I expect your gambit uh, results will improve. So they're also a kind of a training vehicle in a way. But in a way, systems are a training vehicle because you want to train on other like weak links in your game. So I consider both systems and gambits as kind of training vehicles. Even if you didn't play them in your one-day chess, I think for online chess, they could give you a feel for the pieces, well, the gambits, and the systems let you just get decent positions so you, you, you're not going to be discouraged in your early steps. So that's how I've organized the course. I hope you find that interesting. Uh, I... I like my uh eventually i was you know really really struggling with the, the title yeah so the fun loving is is actually a reflection of me because as many of you know you know I, I look at my playlists you know look at my smith morrow my king's gamut playlist look at my alvin counts gamut playlist and you'll see that you know I, I think i have been fun loving any openings so okay i hope you do have fun with this course and check out those those discount codes all right thanks very much Comments, questions, likes, shares, etc. Appreciate it. Thanks very much.